if we can take our seats, we're going to get started with our next panel. Um, this is uh, panel number three, and it's uh, titled Natural Gas and Other Energy Takings, Protecting Private Property Rights When the Public Interest is Promoted by a Non-Governmental Entity. Um, I, don't, I think our panelists are known to most of us here. We have two of our former prize winners, uh, Jim Ely and Stu Sturk. And uh, joining them are Alex Klass, who is at uh, University of Minnesota, and then Andrew Brigham, um, who uh, practices out of Jacksonville. Um, we're excited to hear from them. I was saying to some of the panelists right before we started, uh, there was a, the Supreme Court just granted cert in a pipeline case uh, that came out of Virginia from the Fourth Circuit, this Atlantic Coast pipeline, um, which involves some permits from the Forest Service. Um, the court today, this morning, granted cert for that. So we'll uh, keep our fingers crossed and probably get a decision by June, I imagine, uh, on that issue. Um, but, but natural gas uh, takings and other energy takings certainly kind of a hot topic. Um, and so we have some of the best and brightest here to uh, talk to us about that. Uh, we're going to lead off in order here, Jim, then Alex, then Stu, and Andrew. So. Well, I want to thank uh, Linda and Joe and so many others for having me back again. I keep thinking one of these years I'll wear out my welcome here at Brigham and Hanner. Uh, but it's always a pleasure to be here and see so many uh, uh, friends and familiar faces uh, and uh, listen to so many challenging panels as we have listened to this morning. And I hope ours will be up, up to snuff. Um, pipelines. Now, what I know about pipelines is not vast. Uh, that well, the panelists here are far more knowledgeable than I. Uh, but it is quite apparent to anyone that uh, pipelines are much in the news and a heavy subject of controversy today. Uh, anyone who's followed even the most casually the proposed Keystone XL pipeline project knows it seems to have dragged on forever. Uh, it was no, no particular end in sight. Nor is the controversy over pipelines confined to the United States. Uh, both Canada and Mexico are not having experienced significant disputes over pipeline construction. Now, let me, let me make clear at the outset that I think much of the opposition to pipelines is grounded in broad environmental concerns and has very little to do with the niceties of eminent domain law. The fundamental goal, it seems to me, of critics of the pipeline expansion is they wish to curtail reliance on fossil fuels. Um, it really is not a matter of um, what they think about eminent domain or property rights. Indeed, in other contexts, and I've been in a number of programs with various individuals, and in other contexts, they show remarkably little interest in private property rights. Uh, for example, in the regulatory takings field. Nonetheless, I'm going to confine my remarks to eminent domain questions, and other panelists may pick up the environmental issues. Now, as a person who's largely trained in legal history, you have to prepare yourself for a bit of a black, backward glance at things. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, the first key point, I think, is that uh, takings by private entities is not novel. It is not new. Uh, they were takings for private entities as far back as the American colonial period. The most conspicuous example, and the one that historians have treated at great length, are the Mill Acts of the colonial period. Basically, this legislation authorized a person to flood the land of his neighbor uh, in order to erect a dam, which in turn could create water power uh, and would permit him to grind uh, grain. This was widespread throughout the colonial period, and as far as I know, proceeded largely without challenge. There was, of course, a compensation requirement, and compensation seems to have been paid, but it's difficult to unravel at this vantage point whether the compensation was adequate or would satisfy our conceptions of just. This uh, practice of mill acts was not really challenged at all until after the uh, American Revolution. 
Now, mill acts, I think, to this point at least, could be fairly easily justified in terms of the fact that public grist mills were essentially utilities. They were required to serve all comers, and their rates were regulated. So they fit, I think, fairly comfortably into the idea of a colonial utility. In any event, the practice had been time honored. And by the time issues were raised after the adoption of the Constitution and Bill of Rights, by that time, the mill acts had been around for so long that courts had very little difficulty in sustaining them. More troublesome, more troublesome, however, uh, after the American Revolution was the use of mills to grind, not to grind grain for the community, uh, but to generate water power for fledgling manufacturing establishments. This caused difficulty, caused pause in some courts, and they divided on this issue. It's probably fair to say that the majority of courts somewhat reluctantly went along with the notion that using water power for this purpose did satisfy the public use requirement. Sometimes they basically seem, seem to feel that they were essentially precluded by the earlier uh, grist mills uh, and didn't really analyze the situation very fully or much further. Other courts blew the whistle. They drew, they drew a distinction between the mill acts, which serviced the community and served all comers, and generating uh, water power for basically one or two private manufacturing establishments. But the key thing is, I think, is that the controversy over the mill acts and whether they could or couldn't be used for manufacturing purposes was soon dwarfed by the onset of the transportation revolution. In the years after the American Revolution, Americans threw themselves with great enthusiasm into one form of transportation improvement after another. By the 18th, the 18th century, within less than a decade after the end of the American Revolution, they were granting eminent domain authority to canal companies. Private canal companies, which hoped to make profits. Most of them didn't make profits, but that's beside the point. They were private enterprises. Uh, and they were on a profit-making basis. Uh, and, of course, not content with canals, they would frequently uh, proceed to develop eminent domain power on turnpike companies. Uh, so we had canals, we had turnpike companies taking people's land on the basis of compensation, I understand, but nonetheless, private enterprises uh, in a corporate format taking private property. Indeed, some of these Enterprises were also empowered not just to take land, but to take any materials, nearby timber, for example, that would be useful uh, to carry out their projects. Now, courts had little difficulty upholding these. Canals and turnpike companies, to the extent that they were challenged, were invariably sustained by the courts of the early 19th century. Well, of course, the granddaddy of all would then make the scene railroads. In short order, railroads became uh, far more important to the U.S. economy and would gradually eclipse canals and turnpikes. I think it's fair to say that railroads and the enormous expansion of railroads in the antebellum era forced American courts for the first time to rather systematically have to address what was meant by public use in the context of large-scale governmentally sponsored, but privately managed projects. The power of eminent domain uh, was first conferred on individual railroads in their, own, in their charters. But gradually, most states adopted general uh, railroad laws granting eminent domain power to any incorporated railroad in the state. A few states tried to get a buy without granting eminent domain power to railroads, and guess what happened? They fell way behind their neighbors in construction of railroads, and that just couldn't happen. Tennessee couldn't have Kentucky building more railroads than Tennessee had. In fact, we had a governor of Tennessee who said that uh, in the antebellum period. So I happened to pick, put that one up. Okay, now obviously, the vast expansion of railroads, I think, created 
created what is basically one of the conundrums in eminent domain law. Typically, you've got two groups of property owners. Of people who are going to benefit from building the railroad, the railroad entrepreneurs, and of course the landowners who may or may not want to have a railroad run across their property. Now I say may or may not, and I mean that's important. Many people in the 19th century were thrilled to have railroads come to their community. Railroads meant access to markets, uh, railroads meant better communication, travel opportunities. A lot of people actually donated going to railroads. It wasn't all taking situation, but clearly eminent domain power was in the backdrop for, for the railroad companies. Um, courts early recognized that railroads were a public use. Yeah, there were some dissenting voices. Uh, there were some judges that were bothered by this. Railroads, after all, were private property making, profit making enterprises. At least they hoped to make profits again. A lot of them didn't, but they hoped to make profits. Uh, and they, they thought it was uh, pretty dubious that these railroads were actually a public use. Uh, but nonetheless, they didn't carry the day. Overwhelmingly, judicial opinion favored the construction of railroads. They were improving transportation. They were available to anybody who paid the fares or the, or the, or the rates uh, to use them to ship or to or travel. Um, and of course, they were has historically viewed as common carriers with obligations that common carriers had had first in England and then, of course, in this country uh, for many years. Lastly, I think this is an important point. Courts also early recognized that railroads, like canals before them, had to follow a certain line. You couldn't have a railroad just zigzag around people's property. Uh, anyone you could have a canal just zigzag around, you had to follow a line of, of development. And typically, their engineers would lay out what was the, the best route, and that's the one they would follow. Several courts expressed very clearly that in their mind, you couldn't have a recalcitrant uh, or a, a stubborn uh, person block a project they, was as important as people thought railroads were simply because they didn't want it or they were going to hold you up for some more money, something of that character. Uh, you just couldn't have, couldn't, we couldn't have the neighborhood drunk block building a railroad. Okay? So uh, that was another argument that, that courts had little difficulty in deciding that we just had to go with railroads. Now, what does all this mean? It means that certainly by the 1850s, American courts had come to the position that there was no great difficulty in delegating eminent domain power to private corporations. In fact, by the 1850s, I think the New York Court of Appeals is saying, well, that's just too late in the day for that argument any longer. Um, we, we can delegate to uh, any number of large corporations who are carrying out a public use or a public purpose or a public interest. Ah, this is interesting because now we begin to get the terms confused a bit. The Constitution says public use, and many courts did say it was a public use, but they also sometimes began talking about public interest and public purpose, which aren't quite the same thing. A little more elastic, at least in my mind, uh, than public use per se. Now, I think it's also important to bear in mind that in view of this delegation pattern that I've been trying to describe, eminent domain in the 19th century was more widely used by private enterprise than it was by the government of any form itself. The federal government wasn't even clear had eminent domain power until after the American Civil War, uh, when the Supreme Court recognized it in the Cole case. And state governments did have eminent domain power and occasionally used it, yes. But state governments were really cash strapped. And they found it very difficult to raise significant revenue through taxation. Because taxation then and now is not the most popular thing uh, on the legislator's plate. So uh, they were very happy to have these public projects undertaken by private groups because we might get a railroad, we might get a canal, and we didn't actually have to pay for it <laughs> ourselves. Bear in mind that when they encouraged the transcontinental railroads, which the government certainly encouraged, they showered all kinds of benefits on these railroad companies, land grants and treasury bonds, 
They didn't give me any cash. No, there was no taxpayer money put up because they didn't think, they didn't think that was something that was ever going to apply. Uh, as I said before, there were some skeptics. The prominent treatise writer Thomas Cooley was a bit of a skeptic. Cooley generally favored a, a, a narrower reading of public use. If something had to be ac access to the public, seemed to be his, his key. And he was concerned that an open-ended definition of public use would really be uh, destructive to private property rights. But even Cooley, even Cooley recognized that the situation with the railroads, the ball game was over. Uh, he said it was a, what I quote him here, I said, it's a convenient legal fiction, uh, he said, that the railroads are public use, but uh, they're going to be built, and that's all there is to it. Uh, and so, uh, and they might be a special exception anyway, because they were subject to supervision, and they did have certain common carrier duties. Now, you could argue, of course, that to this point, this use of eminent domain is fairly consistent with one of the main themes of the 19th century, which was to develop the United States. Economic <coughs> development was a major overriding goal, one shared really by all the major political parties and figures. They disagreed don't often about means or emphasis, but everybody they wanted development. And eminent domain was widely used for that purpose uh, throughout the 19th century. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, thank God his time is almost over, because he hasn't said a word hardly about pipelines, right? <laughs> Uh, we're, supposed to be, we're supposed to be talking about. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about energy takings, because the early ones fall largely into the same pattern that I've already described. Uh, states started granting eminent domain power to pipeline companies right after the American Civil War, if not before, but certainly after the Civil War. I've traced it to that with no great trouble. Um, and uh, by 1888, uh, treatise writer John Lewis easily concluded that lines of tubing for the conveyance of petroleum was a public use, uh, and just announced that in his famous treatise on eminent domain law as if that was the rule. Uh, state courts invariably upheld uh, the, the use of eminent domain by uh, pipeline companies without any great difficulty. Congress, of course, would jump into the act, too, and I'm sure that uh, Alexi and others, we're going to talk more about this, uh, but uh, by putting pipelines under the control of the ICC and the Hepburn Act, uh, and even in the case of the Natural Gas Act, granting eminent domain power to uh, natural gas pipeline companies uh, in 1947. Uh, so, uh, for decades after World War II, the acquisition of pipelines for natural gas and for petroleum purposes doesn't seem to have been particularly controversial. And very few doubted that they satisfied the public use requirement. Uh, but in recent years, that picture has changed. Uh, as oil and natural gas productions have increased, they have spurred increased interest in, of course, the transportation of these products, and hence uh, <coughs> pipeline construction all of course, the United States. Um, and there have been challenges now, reopening, if you will, the once seemingly settled question as to whether these pipelines constitute public use. Uh, others on the panel are much better in a position to uh, address this issue than I. Uh, my sense is that the results, first of all, there haven't been that many really on the merits, uh, and the results are rather, are rather mixed to some extent at this point. But it is my sense that the majority of courts that have addressed the issue uh, have adhered to the view, a traditional view, I might say, uh, that pipelines constituted public use. In that connection, I call to your attention a recent decision by the uh, Supreme Court of Iowa, uh, which heard a challenge uh, to uh, the condemnation of pipeline easements for the Dakota Access Pipeline. Uh, significantly, the court first rejected Kelo, the reasoning in Kelo, and said that they would be guided by Justice O'Connor's dissenting opinion in Kelo in handling uh, eminent domain cases, not incidentally the first state Supreme Court to take that position. Nonetheless, having taken that step, the court went on to say that the pipeline benefited the public generally in the form of cheaper and safer transportation of oil, uh, 
and we benef benefited all consumers of, of oil uh, by it would have reduced reduce prices, uh, nor were they impressed with the argument that the pipeline did not pick up or drop off oil within the state, noting that Iowa agriculture depended very heavily upon petroleum products imported from other states. In other words, we have sort of a seamless web of the economy here, uh, and we, the key question is not whether they are necessarily picking up oil in Iowa, which to my knowledge is not an oil producing state. In any event, I bored you quite enough uh, for one afternoon. Uh, I hope this is a, a useful background uh, for what I'm sure will be the erudite presentations by my co-panelists. Thank you. in the discussion. Um, my presentation is also going to be somewhat historical in nature, but somewhat more recent history. Uh, so we'll sort of move up into the 2000s. Let's see, as long as I can, there we go. Okay, so a little bit of background. And, and I should say first that the, my remarks today are based on a paper that I've co-authored with James Coleman at SMU Law School, and it will be um, in final form and in print in I think a couple of months. So we have many uses of eminent domain. We have highways and roads. Eminent domain is used to build those projects. That's the government use of eminent domain. The government is the plaintiff in these eminent domain actions. We also have economic development and redevelopment of property. Once again, there the government is bringing the eminent domain action. The government is the plaintiff. But we also have examples of eminent domain actions where you have a private entity that is the plaintiff in these cases oil and gas pipelines we've talked about already in, in, Jim's, in Jim's presentation, um, electric transmission lines, actions brought by utility companies um, and other companies building that infrastructure. Again, examples of private use of eminent domain through delegated authority from the state or from the federal government. So we have the Kilo case, which was a big case in 2005. Most people in the room are familiar with the Kilo case. What I'll most say is that although there's been some criticism of Kelo already today, I will just say that I think Kelo is a perfectly fine Supreme Court decision, um, putting myself at odds with many in the room today, but I think it's a perfectly good decision. I think it there, was a wonderful dissent. <laughs> <laughs> but there clearly was a huge public backlash against the decision. It was one of those cases, and often comes up in property um, cases. Uh, uh, adverse possession is another example where the law has been the same for a very long time and then it's some decision captures the public's attention and they say that's the law well if that's the law I want to change it and that is what happened here more than 40 states amended either their state constitutions or enacted statutes to limit the use of eminent domain for economic redevelopment projects these changes though this kilo backlash and the post kilo legislation focus almost exclusively on the government use of eminent domain. And that's not surprising. You have the Institute for Justice, you have other organizations that were focused on government use and abuse of eminent domain. That was the narrative surrounding the case. So there was really no emphasis at all in these state reforms um, on private party use of eminent domain. There were some lawyers and lobbyists and companies who were worried that the legislation might go in that direction. They sent their attorneys to the legislature just to make sure the legislature didn't go too crazy and started limiting eminent domain for pipelines or transmission lines. For the most part, they didn't. These were reforms that were focused on the government use of eminent domain. So Kilo's decided in 2005, the state legislative reforms take place mostly <coughs> within those next two years. So by 2007, we're kind of done. Legislatures are on to other topics. 2007, though, we have massive changes in the U.S. energy economy. Fracking is now a thing. We know how to do it. We have now huge new sources of oil and gas throughout the United States in new, location, new locations. Also, we have a, a growing and much more public concern about climate change around this time and the role of fossil fuels in causing climate change. Because of 
these new oil and gas resources, as well as new wind energy resources that are developing around this time, we have a real need in the country and a real desire for new energy transport infrastructure for these new energy resources in new locations. So here's where we have our shale oil and gas resources. So let's see if I can get the pointer to work here. No luck. Okay, so the green is where we have a lot of new gas resources that were not accessible before. The blue areas is where we have new oil resources um, as well. Geologists and everyone else knew these resources were, were, were there, but they could not be um, economically extracted. Now they can. As a result, you see crude oil production, which had been declining. This graph starts in about 1980. All through the 80s and the 90s, we're worried about running out of oil. We're worried about our dependence on the Middle East. All that changes in 2007. The yellow is Texas. Texas oil production booms. North Dakota, that hadn't been doing much in terms of oil production for years, is now the number two oil producing state in the country. So you see, all of a sudden, we've got all this oil up in North Dakota. Um, we've always had oil in Texas for a long time, Oklahoma as well, but so we have these new resources in different parts of the country. We see the same thing for gas. So the line is there, 2015, look at the green, uh, the green part of the graph. So all of a sudden we have all this new shale gas and we're going to continue to have it and continue to be able to get more of it out until 2040. And who's our number two gas state? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania hasn't produced gas since the 1880s, the 1890s. So we have new gas in a different part of the country. So we got to transport these new oil and gas resources. So we obviously have a lot of oil pipelines and related pipelines around Texas and Oklahoma. Those are resources we've had since the 1950s. But now we've got all this new oil in North Dakota, and you see there's not a lot of pipelines in North Dakota other than ones that are coming down from Canada for import. Gas, you see the same thing. Lots of oil and gas activity down in Texas and the Gulf, and then gas pipelines bringing that gas up to um, northeastern cities. But now we got all this gas in Pennsylvania as well. How do we um, get that gas to where people want to use it? So, okay, we have very different laws that govern the use of eminent domain for energy transport. It would be, uh, uh, be way too easy to have the same regime um, for, uh, for all of these different uh, resources. So, natural gas in the 1930s was federalized. So, um, uh, siting authority and eminent domain authority moved to the federal government. Uh, because uh, there were states that were blocking some natural gas pipelines from going from Texas to the uh, East Coast at that time. So we created a federal system for a certificate of public convenience and necessity from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and nationwide eminent domain authority delegated to natural gas pipelines to build those pipelines. Um, not the same concerns with oil. We've been able to transport oil lots of different ways since the, since the time we discovered it. You can use, um, you use team, teams of horses, that's where the term teamsters comes from, is the, team, the, oil, the teams of horses in the Pennsylvania oil fields. We use ships, we use trains, um, and we use pipelines. So there's never been a need, really, um, to think about federal eminent domain authority for oil pipelines, other than during World War II, when the Germans cut off the shipping routes up the East Coast. And then there was nationwide eminent domain authority for oil pipelines, but just during the duration of the war. Then it went back to the states. Um, as I said, the kilo backlash in the states really didn't change these laws um, at all, particularly with regard to oil pipelines. But we have even more recent developments. So we have new partnerships between environmental groups and property right advocates to limit eminent domain for fossil fuel infrastructure. So these are groups that normally don't work together and often don't like each other very much. Um, but here, at least with regard to oil and gas pipelines, their interests are aligned. Uh, we have a lot more public op opposition over the use of eminent domain for all sorts of pipelines. And I list just several oil pipelines and natural gas pipelines. Um, and depending on where you're from, you have more, uh, you know, more or less knowledge, at least of some of these natural gas pipelines. A lot of the focus on the natural gas pipelines in terms of opposition is on the East Coast. Um, we have new state law moratorium on eminent domain for oil pipelines and more state court scrutiny as to whether eminent domain for oil and gas projects are in fact a public use. So let me go into a few of those into more detail. 
So South Carolina and Georgia, a few years ago, each of them put a moratorium on eminent domain for oil pipelines. Um, these were not environmental groups uh, who were behind this. These were property rights advocates who did not want the Palmetto Pipeline um, coming through the state and coming through their property. Um, so these, these moratoriums were not put in place for environmental reasons, although I think there were some environmental groups working way behind the scenes with the property rights advocates in terms of the work that they did um, at the state legislature. Lots of federal lawsuits challenging eminent domain for gas pipelines on multiple um, fronts. The, the, the case that the, Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court just grants a cert on today doesn't have to do with eminent domain, um, but it deals with um, a permit over the Appalachian Trail and whether it is the Forest Service or the Park Service um, who can grant that permit. But there are lots of challenges to uh, the public use for these um, natural gas pipelines, questioning whether these uh, grant, the granting of public use is consistent with Kilo. And in fact, two cases that were just decided a couple weeks ago, one in the Fourth Circuit and one in the Third Circuit that dealt exactly with the eminent domain question. So the Fourth Circuit case questioned whether you could use eminent domain for a pipeline that was mostly designed to export natural gas to Canada. Is that a public use? How do you define the public? If it's not benefiting any, any, any member of the public in the US, um, is that a public use? They didn't say it wasn't. They said, FERC, you didn't explain it to us well enough. Why don't you go back and try again? The Third Circuit case is, uh, involving the Nexus pipeline is even more significant. Um, this case held that there's no power under the Natural Gas Act to bring an eminent domain action for lands owned by the state or even private lands where the state has a conservation easement over the land. So if the pipeline is trying to go through a state, like New Jersey in this case, or New York, or Massachusetts, where the state is opposed to that pipeline for whatever reason, this case would say that there's no eminent domain authority by the pipeline. The, uh, the case cited Kilo, Fifth Amendment, and also the Eleventh Amendment. So the Natural Gas Act um, did not grant that authority to displace the state's interest. And in fact, they weren't sure that even if Congress wanted to amend the Natural Gas Act to do that, whether they had the authority to do so. It's a fascinating case. There's been quite a bit of state judicial scrutiny of eminent domain for energy companies. So the use of eminent domain to take property for nat underground natural gas storage, pretty uncontroversial in both California and in Oklahoma and other states that have had oil and gas for a long time. Uh, the Pennsylvania Su Supreme Court said, nope, that is not a public use. Uh, it benefits private gas companies, and there's only a mere incidental benefit to the public. Even in Texas, so Texas, by the way, if you want to use eminent domain to build an oil pipeline, your requirement is you check a box saying you are a common carrier, and you go and build your pipeline. There's no certificate of need process, no nothing. Even there, there was a series of cases that said that the pipeline, in this case it was a carbon dioxide pipeline that's used in the oil industry, um, you have to at least show that it's going to serve the public by allowing third parties and others to use um, that pipeline. So even in Texas, there is some questioning of public use. Okay, so at the end of the paper, we look at how should we think about eminent domain and public use for energy projects. I think about eminent domain as an incentive to build infrastructure, to build projects. That's why eminent domain authority is granted to private parties. That's why the government does it. It's like a tax incentive or any other incentive. You're trying to encourage a particular activity. So states can determine what type of infrastructure they want to promote through these various incentives. Granting a tax break, taking away a tax break granting eminent domain authority, taking away eminent domain authority. So it would, it's a perfectly legitimate policy uh, approach, in my view, for a state to decide, we don't like fossil fuel infrastructure, and we're no longer going to grant eminent domain authority for oil pipelines. The state of New York could decide to do that. The state of New York now has a, um, has a mandate um, to uh, use, uh, to, to be basically a carbon-free state, to move away from carbon-free energy, and one policy approach they could use for that would be, say, no more fossil fuel, uh, no more eminent domain for fossil fuel infrastructure. I worry that limiting eminent domain for infrastructure more generally means 
you can't do anything. So you want to do an energy transition, let's say to more clean energy, you're going to need to build a lot of transmission lines. You're going to need to build a lot of infrastructure. Um, and I worry about some of the property rights advocacy that ends up being just anti-infrastructure and anti-build um, uh, anti anything. Um, so I, but I think you can pick and choose if you're a state as to what type of infrastructure you want to build and develop your eminent domain policy um, accordingly. There's also procedural reforms, I think, that can help in terms of limiting the opposition to some of these projects in general. Um, you can have enhanced compensation. You can create a fixed percentage over fair market value. Some states did that um, in response to um, the Kelo decision. Uh, you, could, you could extend that to pipeline takings if you wanted to do that or even provide royalty payments. Uh, lots of uh, the Indian tribes often are able to negotiate that because pipeline companies do not have eminent domain authority over tribal land, so they have to work out um, other approaches with regard to that. Uh, there's some other landowner um, option rights uh, that we talk about in the paper to sort of uh, more level the playing field between um, uh, uh, property owners and the con condemning authority, whether it's an energy company um, or anyone else, and I think I am out of time. Yes, am I? Okay. Uh, so I will stop now. Happy to answer questions later. Thanks again. Thanks to Linda for inviting me, and for to, thanks to Andrew and to Joe for making all this possible. I want to echo uh, James's hope that uh, I, I haven't overstayed my welcome, and I fear that by the end of my talk, I will have overstayed <laughs> my welcome. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, we, we've started. J Jim, I think, has sort of given you the forest of uh, natural for natural gas act condemnations, and I think. Alex has provided the trees. I'm going to give you a little piece in the weeds, uh, and, and, and probably not much more than that. And that's really in what, what role does state law and federal law have in determining the, uh, the compensation that's available in, in Natural Gas Act condemnations? Uh, uh, this is one of, the many, many of, one of the many federalism issues that arise with respect to, uh, to these condemnations. And I think Alex has already pointed out what uh, some of the others are, including uh, the Eleventh Amendment issue that uh, uh, arose in the Penn East case uh, about whether, in fact, uh, the government delegates have the power to condemn state land or land in which state has an interest, uh, an issue on the third, which the Third Circuit seemed to suggest uh, there isn't going to be any power for, uh, for private delegates to do that. But, but again, my issue is a lot narrower, that, narrower than that. Um, and the issue arises in a number of different contexts. It can arise when the question is whether uh, the, uh, a government delegate uh, has to follow, uh, who, who in, a, in a federal condemnation is, is entitled to the, uh, the, the consequential damages that state law might allow. It might arise if there are different evidentiary rules about what kinds of, uh, uh, of evidence of value can come in in state court and in federal court. Um, and it also uh, arises in the attorney's fees context that Thor mentioned earlier and that I know we'll hear more from Andrew about later. Um, and the issue has arisen in a number of Court of Appeals cases. Um, and in most of these cases, and at least these three cases that, that I have out here, uh, what the Court of Appeals has done is they've examined the issue and said, the question of compensation is a matter of federal common law, but as a matter of federal common law, we are going to use state law. And uh, I think, for the most part, these courts have been correct in using state law, concluding that state law at least applies to some of these issues, but I think they've swept with a little bit too, uh, too, too broad a brush. And they've also failed to recognize, I think, that uh, federal common law ought to be irrelevant here, that the issue is not federal common law, but federal constitutional law. Uh, and when federal courts do apply state law, they should be applying it because of the constitutional structure, not because of federal common law. Uh, now, in a sense, and nobody wants to hear about Erie versus Tompkins in a, in a, in a property law talk, but the issue uh, was largely irrelevant before Erie because federal courts basically ignored state decisional law, period. I don't think Erie actually has anything to do with this problem now, but it's certainly true that after Erie, uh, 
uh, federal courts became more sensitive to uh, what role state law should have in, uh, in federal proceedings. Uh, and the, if we look at the first case in which the, uh, the Supreme Court faced the issue of what role uh, state law should have in a condemnation case, the first uh, post-Erie case to deal with that is United States versus Miller. And uh, Miller was a case in which the uh, landowner was seeking the, uh, to have his property valued at the moment of formal condemnation because the condemnation itself, or the announcement of condemnation, caused the value of the land to spike. And what the Supreme Court did in Miller is to reject the idea that even though, though Cal well, the California law was applicable, California law said you're entitled to whatever the value was at the time of formal condemnation. And Miller said, no, nah, the federal government doesn't have to compensate for the increase in value after that announcement. Now, a number of cases after Miller read Miller as saying basically that when the United States is the condemnor, uh, state law is irrelevant. But most of those cases, I think, were cases in which uh, it was not clear that there was any difference between federal and state law. It was just easier for the court to say, okay, well, uh, we're going to apply federal law. We're not going to worry about state law. But nevertheless, that broad reading of Miller led uh, a, a number of cases in a number of uh, courts, including the, the three that I uh, posted before, to uh, distinguish Miller on the ground that the condemnor in Miller was the government and, and the Miller rule shouldn't apply to condemnation by government delegates. And what I'd like to argue is that that distinction doesn't make any sense. Right? That, the same compensation rules ought to apply whether the federal government or a delegee uh, is, is doing the condemnation. But I'd also like to say that Miller itself was rightly decided, but that Miller shouldn't be read to require application of federal law to all aspects of condemnation by either the federal government or the government delegates. And again, what I'd like to do is just start with the fact that, that uh, the Constitution is ultimately the, the, the question in these cases. Uh, the focus on federal common law is peculiar in that we normally think of federal common law as something that arises when there are either gaps in federal statutes or where there's something of exclusively federal concern uh, where Congress has done nothing. And neither of those really applies in the eminent domain context. This is not an area where Congress could even specify exactly what the compensation is. If Congress, for instance, were to take the position that just compensation is 10% of, of market value, uh, the Supreme Court would clearly hold that that's inconsistent with the constitutional requirement. Uh, so, and if Congress can't do that, it's hard to see why federal common law uh, would be the, the body of law that would be relevant in figuring out what just compensation would be. If we think about the Constitution itself, as a couple of people have pointed out today, the Constitution's takings clause has four relevant phrases taking, public, private property, public use, and just compensation. And for our purposes, the, the, whether the property's been taken is largely irrelevant. We know the property's taken in these condemnation cases. And public use, uh, although Alex uh, has correctly pointed out that in many of the state law cases, public use is a, uh, is a real issue, in federal cases, uh, for the most part, public use is not much of a problem after Kelo. Uh, so the real questions that we're focusing on are uh, what constitutes private property and what constitutes just compensation. And when we think about uh, uh, property, which is critical, um, as Tom has made clear and as Steve has made clear, made clear as well, for taking clause prop, uh, purposes, property has aspects both of state law and of federal law. Right? Uh, state law might decide to recognize a variety of rights and it might even attach the label of property to those rights. Uh, but only some of the rights that state courts, that state law recognizes, actually qualify as property for constitutional purposes. And we can put different labels on exactly what those rights are. Tom talks about discrete items over which an owner has a right to exclude. Uh, Steve has a somewhat different formulation, but they're capturing the same sort of thing. We're thinking about a discrete item uh, that, uh, that is sold or bought on the market in one way or another. And if we have one of those rights, then compensation is due in any case where state law actually recognizes the right. And I, I think you can find uh, uh, 
support in, from the Supreme Court for that proposition. And in, in, the, uh, in the Powelton case, for instance, the court says that though the meaning of property as used in the Fifth Amendment is a federal question, it will normally obtain its content by reference to local law, again, recognizing a both federal and state component to, uh, to what constitutes property. So property has both a state and a federal component. Uh, just compensation, on the other hand, is basically a constitutional construct. Um, and what the court has done in the Monongahela case, which uh, we've already had reference to, is to essentially say that, look, just compensation is a matter for courts. It's figuring out what, the, what, uh, what constitutes just compensation is a constitutional inquiry that, uh, that uh, is, is a judicial one. In light of that scheme, it seems to me there's no real reason, no room for distinguishing uh, takings that the US government makes from takings by uh, government delegates. That uh, in each case, if we decide that the property qualifies as property within the meaning of the takings clause, then compensation, is, it shouldn't matter whether the taker is, uh, is the federal government or condemn nor. Similarly, the inquiries about whether the uh, whether the state recognizes the right doesn't differ depending on who the condemnor is. And what constitutes just compensation, if it has a federal constitutional meaning, shouldn't matter. So what I would suggest is that in these cases, there ought not to be any, uh, any real difference between uh, government takings and private takings. Uh, at the same time, I would suggest that Miller was rightly decided. Because in Miller, unlike in most takings cases, the interest for which Miller sought compensation was not created by state law. Right? It was purely the product of a federal, a federal action. That is, the federal government certainly could have decided that the, the condemnation becomes effective upon the initial announcement. And if it did that, well, there'd be certainly no room for the landowner to get any more compensation. And it's the fact that the federal government created this interim between the initial announcement and the formal taking that caused this value to spike. And whether the landowner ought to be entitled to compensation for that really is a matter on which state law should be irrelevant. It's not a right that was created by state law. And so measuring compensation ought not to turn on, uh, on what state law might have been. So, but where does that leave us? So even if Miller was, was, uh, was correctly decided, uh, where does that leave us? Well, first, I would say that a number of state law rules uh, should be binding in Natural Gas Act condemnations, right, and in other federal condemnations. So if you, for instance, we take the uh, issue that uh, the Third Circuit had to uh, resolve in, in a case this past July, uh, Pennsylvania law uh, included a provision that entitled condemnees to, uh, the, to damages for any adjustments to uh, retained property when there was a partial taking. Now, to the extent that Pennsylvania law recognizes that uh, the landowner would have the right to prevent the interference that necessitated those adjustments, it seems to me that the right to prevent that interference falls within the category of property rights that's protected by the taking clause. It's a right to exclude from a discrete parcel of property. And so I think that the, the Third Circuit got it right in deciding uh, uh, that, that state law should apply, should control on that issue. Similarly, if we take a look at another case, the Georgia Power case that the Fifth Circuit decided, uh, th that's a case where, uh, another partial takings case, where what Georgia law did is provide that a condemnor may not offset uh, the benefits to the, created to, uh, to the retained land when paying compensation for the land that was actually taken. And again, that seems to me that uh, an issue where state law recognizes a right to segregate the parcels into two. And uh, if state law rec recognizes the right to segregate and to say, all right, you've taken this parcel, compensation is due to that parcel regardless of what happens with the neighboring parcel, that's a state law issue on which uh, federal courts should have to defer. On the other hand, with respect to what we think of as rules of procedure, it seems clear that federal rules apply between uh, uh, rule 71.1 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, which governs uh, procedure in eminent domain proceedings, and Rule 101 of the Federal Rules of Evidence, which provides that those rules apply in federal courts, uh, together with the Rules Enabling Act supersession provision. Uh, it seems pretty clear that if we have something that qualifies as a rule of procedure, uh, 
federal law is going to apply. Federal courts are free to ignore state law. That brings us to attorney's fees, the issue on which I'm sure I make people unhappy. Uh, for multiple reasons, I think that uh, state law rules on attorney's fees are not applicable in natural gas act condemnations. And I'm not saying this because I, as a matter of policy, think this is a good result. But as a matter of law, if we think about what constitutes property within the meaning of the, uh, of, of the, the taking clause, the right to attorney's fees is not a right in a discrete thing. Uh, it doesn't embody any sort of a right to exclude. Uh, and from that standpoint, it doesn't seem to be the kind of private property that is protected by the takings clause. Moreover, in the absence of congressional action, the Supreme Court has held in the Alyeska uh, pipeline case, the preva prevailing litigant is not entitled to attorney's fees unless Congress has explicitly authorized those fees. And there is no explicit authorization for these fees in, in, uh, in condemnation cases. Uh, on top of that, as I mentioned, when we're dealing with rules of procedure, rules of procedure, state rules of procedure are typically not applicable in federal courts. And if you look at almost all of the state attorney's fees rules, they're essentially procedural rules. They're designed to reduce the volume of litigation by encouraging the condemnor to make reasonable offers. And that's particularly evident in the many state statutes that uh, entitle the, uh, the condemnee to attorney's fees only in those cases where the government's offer uh, is sufficiently low compared to the ultimate award that the, the, uh, the statute has deemed the government offer to be inadequate. Right? So if the government made a good offer, no attorney's fees. Even in Florida, and I know Florida is the subject of, uh, of litigation that uh, Andrew and others are, are, are interested in, the Florida Supreme Court has said that attorney's fees may be part of the full compensation mandated by the Florida Constitution. But even that court has held that the condemnee is entitled to those fees only when the condemning authority engages in tactics that cause excessive litigation. OK, so where are we? Well, with respect to condemnations by the government, and we're talking about attorney's fees, the Equal Access to Justice Act uh, makes explicit provisions for attorney's fees in condemnation cases in a limited range of cases where, uh, the, w w where the government's offer has been uh, inadequate. That statute, with respect to US government condemnations, clearly preempts state law. The remaining issue is what happens when the condemnor is a delegate. And the problem is that the Equal Access to Justice Act, by its terms, applies when the United States is a party. The United States is not a party when there's a delegate. So one position that one could take is, well, that means no attorney's fees at all, because Congress has thought about the issue in light of Alyeska Pipeline and has permitted fees only in specifically enumerated circumstances, and this isn't one of them. I think it more likely that enacting the e e equal, equal Access to Justice Act Congress had assumed that condemnation would be led by the government and uh, not by delegates. The House report makes it clear that the statute was intended to uh, cover condemnation cases. So I think there's a pretty strong case for saying that the same provisions that apply with respect to the US government also apply with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, 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 de delegates of the government. But in any event, if if attorney's fees are available, they're available only by virtue of federal law, I think, not by virtue of state law provisions that make fees available. Uh, anyway, so that's where I am, and I'm sure I've made many people in the room unhappy. Uh, <laughs> but I'll turn it over to Andrew to tell me why I was wrong on every point. Well, too much to say, <laughs> too little time to say it. Uh, but I'll start. You, Stuart, are always welcome here. <laughs> Thank you. And you're always welcome at my dinner table. <laughs> uh, let me say that uh, uh, I do have a lot to say, and I think I'm going to try to invert the points, and I'm going to start backwards from trial, because that that's what good trial lawyers do. Um, and then I hope I'll have enough time to kind of circle back to the choice of law, but if I don't, uh, you can read some of the materials that are posted online. Uh, most of the time when we gather, the emphasis on our constitutional rights is, is on that public purpose part of the takings clause. I want to first have you think about just compensation. 
because we don't often bring that up. It's kind of considered just automatic. If there's a taking, there's going to be just compensation. And uh, perhaps the Nick case is kind of a, a revival of sorts, only because it says the just compensation part of the takings clause is an important element. The Supreme Court's concerned about it, and I think federal courts are concerned about it. Um, for those, and, and uh, I enjoyed Alex's paper, it was, it was very helpful because you, you were, uh, of course, showing why are we having all these pipeline takings, uh, you know, really circa the last 10 years. And it was extremely helpful to kind of put those points together. And at the end of your article, I know that Alex makes uh, some suggestions that are helpful for the, for the property rights, for the landowner. Uh, I think some of these are enhanced compensation. I think Tom, you and Jim Creel have said in redevelopment or economic development cases, what about 125% worth of fair market value? Uh, a little news from the trench. Uh, I can't think of a case in 30 years where if I looked at the government lawyer and their appraisers and they looked at us, that we would agree on one thing, fair market value. And it's not just a little 10%, it's, it's the whole case. So let me work backwards from that. I'm gonna to try to move quickly, but look at what happens. Please understand that this is a difference when you have the federal government taking property and a private for-profit company. The federal government at least has some element of having responsibility to the landowner because they're a member of the public. Uh, that little bit of conscience is, is perhaps, you know, um, uh, helpful. Uh, tax dollars are a big part of the, the court's consideration, the public uh, purse. It's different than a private company. And more than this, think about it from the landowner's shoes. Think about it about a $100 billion company with unlimited resources coming in to take, not only take the property, but value it. So having said that, let's move. Uh, Sable Trail Transmission is a new pipeline that extends from <coughs> Alabama to Florida. Sable Trail is a joint venture of Spectra Energy Partners, Next Era Energy, Duke Energy, Florida Power and Light, and Duke Energy. And you know, the way that FERC approves projects is as long as you have a contract, you know, a related company on one end of the pipe wants to put gas in it, a related company on the other end of the pipe, they all make money together, wants to use it for the power company, okay? Uh, that's all you need. It's like checking the box in Texas, but we have the whole Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to grant certificates of need. This is a $100 billion company. Think about that. Uh, here's the pipeline, again, coming through three states, 494 miles, 268 were in Florida, uh, most of which were a 36-inch pipe. Uh, this uh, pipe is 36 inches with a maximum operating pressure of, of uh, 1456 pounds per square inch. Uh, typically buried three to four feet underground. Uh, when uh, the easements are acquired, they're both temporary and permanent. Uh, every part of the property is cleared. I mean, you, of course, if you get into air, aerial photographs, you can see exactly where these lines are. If you look at it on the ground, nothing is left and the pipe is buried. In Florida, for this 36 inch pipe, it will be capable of transporting one billion cubic feet of gas a day. Now, uh, this is helpful. When Sable Trail came to take properties uh, for its project in Florida, they needed uh, 1,582 properties. They were able to acquire easements from 1,248 people. Now, 263 people were kind of in that class that we might call holdouts. So Sable Trail filed, uh, and in Florida, we've had uh, pipeline companies filing eminent domain in state court for 50 years. They've never filed in federal court for this major of a project. They always had quick taking power under state law. They didn't have quick taking power under federal law until we had the, uh, the case in uh, Virginia in district court the uh, SAGE decision 10 years ago, and that juris jurisprudential trend has gone to work through the country. So now federal courts are open, uh, uh, kind of a, a reverse of NIC, to the pandemic authorities to file in federal court. So uh, here we are with 263 cases, and before you assume that these people are unreasonable in holding out, uh, don't prejudge this. Let me get through my slide presentation. <laughs> Uh, in nearly all pipeline acquisitions, there's going to be a dispute on, on the measure of compensation insofar as severance damages. The pipeline companies recognize that they will pay for the area within the easements. Uh, 
both the temporary and the permanent. Uh, they will give you a, a, a compensation based upon a temporary rental for the land within the temporary easements. They will pay a, a price that's reflective of the square foot value of land within the permanent easements, but typically they look at a, a percentage of fee. So you're going to be, in this case, Sable Trail, and I'm going to point to a case, was at 50%. Because the owner you know, continues to have that enjoyable right of paying taxes uh, and other things, but they have to, of course, honor as the dominant uh, estate is now the easement holder, you know, they're the Serbian estate. They cannot do anything that would interfere with the pipe. But, but when that uh, taking occurs, where the dispute is going to be is the severance damage to the remaining property. And typically, if it's a physical severance, you know, a geometric question, uh, it's cutting through diagonally, and it's, it's uh, of course, uh, clearing the land or buildings, you know, we're going to get to yes pretty quickly on that, and the company will recognize severance damages. It's more on the issue of, is there stigma? Is there some damage due to proximity in and of the pipeline itself? So the pipeline companies, as an industry, they maintain that, in case you don't know it, the pipeline is buried. And if you don't see it, it really isn't there. So there's no damage. You all think about this, but that is the central theme. And it's economic. So property owners disagree. Most property owners would consider that if you put a pipeline three or four feet under the ground that's transporting a billion cubic feet of gas at high pressure, high BTU, and little posts that you know, say warning. Why does it say warning? Okay, they're concerned. And their contention is, I don't want it in my backyard. And think about this, property rights, we all take for granted until when? until they're putting the pipeline in your backyard. Now, I can't make that argument to a Florida jury because that's breaking the golden rule. But everyone thinks about that if they think about it carefully. What would it be like if, if a pipe was within 100 or 300 feet of my house on my property? Would it sell for the same amount? What if there was property just across, you know, a mile away, same property, but one has a pipe and one doesn't? So think about these things. Of the 263 condemnation cases filed in Florida, uh, my law firm, five lawyers in Jacksonville, represented 50 different property owners. Most were rural property owners uh, through the center part, north central part of our state. Um, let's talk about a billion dollar company doing a major acquisition like this. Sable Trail came to Florida, hired three different real estate appraisers. Uh, we engage in litigation. We go through discovery. They paid these appraisers over $8.3 million. I've done eminent domain for not quite 30 years, but getting there. Um, never seen that before. Now, these appraisers prepare what we call damage studies, and typically they're paired sales analysis. So you go and you try to find uh, a sale of a property that's impacted with a pipe, and you compare it to a sale very similar in all respects except the one variable. It is a non-impact property without a pipe. And when they go through these studies and study the trends and try to find like-kind properties to those that are being condemned, um, they conclude that from their analysis, they don't see any damage. That means that the price paid for the property with the pipe compared to the similarly situated property without a pipe are selling for about the same amount. That's their data. Now, uh, that means that there's really no stigma to the property. But when you depose these gentlemen, and ladies, <laughs> and you find out that they're, they're, they're very experienced. I mean, they've been, they've been working on these types of cases for 20 years in most cases. But whenever they've worked on these cases, guess who they've represented? The pipeline companies. And guess what every one of their studies for 20 years have said? And put them on the table, because I will read them. They all say zero. Now, if you think about that, if, if that's really what's happening, for 20 years, is it really so, you know, uh, when we talk about studies, we kind of get down to numbers and statistics, right? Can you imagine that every time that you go out and you objectively try to find what people pay in terms of a property with a pipe and a property without a pipe, can you imagine that nobody will say a negative thing about the property with a pipe? Does that seem a little bit incredible 
or maybe lacking credibility. So at the very front end of these cases, as someone who does <coughs> this for my career, it's very evident to me that there's not a very strong basis for the pipeline company to begin every negotiation for those people that they settled with and those people they take to court, they start at zero. And when a, a small little rural property owner gets a 10 or 20% discount or maybe even double it, they think they're being fairly compensated. So uh, there's a lot of irony in these cases. I love jury trials because I'm kind of an ironic guy. Uh, and this is the one, I love this, okay? Uh, it's buried, nobody sees it, there's no damage. So why does the, uh, you know, Pipeline Safety Hazardous Materials Administration under the DOT, their big mantra, you'll see it on all the pipeline letters, it's what? Know what's below, okay? They want you to know, because guess what? They know it's safety concern. So. Here's some, uh, I'm going to give you a view. Uh-oh, I'm getting hung up here. Houston, we got a problem. Let me see if I can, uh, I can do it this way. All right, so the question is, the question is, here we are, and, you know, I, I am, I haven't been trying federal court cases. The only federal court case I got involved in, I was tapped in our law firm as being the guy to defend against the spoliation charge. Uh, my sister Amy had a case, it was a really swanky hotel in Miami Beach, and it was, uh, it was a zoning case, and it was in federal court, and somehow the 30 boxes in Chicago that everybody thought were the same boxes in Miami Beach were not, and I had to go and kind of do that. Uh, we meant to have all the boxes, but we really didn't, and it was a very uncomfortable position. But now at be met, and it's the first time I've had to try in federal court, and I'm a state court guy. I'm, I don't always button my jacket, and uh, it's, it's a much higher level uh, of decorum and practice, typically. And uh, my question is, is with the federal courts, would they really be thoughtful about this? And when you have 50 cases, think about that. You know, what does that look like? Um, so when we, when we went, we're in front of not just one district judge, we're in front of a judge in Jacksonville, a judge in Tampa, <coughs> judge in Ocala, uh, you know, we are, uh, got the bag, got to travel, uh, and would, what was going to happen? So the first issue was immediate possession, and we did uh, uh, build a defense, but uh, it was very clear from our very first hearing with our first federal judge, Judge Walker, in the Northern District of Florida, they were going to follow SAGE. And so, uh, you know, we had that early in the litigation for about a year. We didn't have any other issues that the court decided. And then they decided some very important issues. They decided that we would have jury trials. The condemning authority, the Sable Trail Pipeline, they wanted commissioners. They wanted to have appointed commissioners. Uh, the courts care very much about property rights. Uh, they wanted all the property owners to know that the federal courts were open to them to have jury trials. And uh, their, their orders stated it just like I'm stating. Um, I will also say that now I'm gonna talk about a case because I want you to think about evidence and proving things because that's what we do in jury trials. So here we have our client. This is now one of the cases that Thor and I, after winning a jury trial, I had, I had 50 cases, two trials, three parcels. So I had one trial with one parcel and another trial, second trial with two parcels. It was a trust in a, in the, it was a farm, and the dad put together the trust, and the son was the farm. Okay, so that was the second trial. Uh, both of these cases are on appeal before the 11th Circuit. Little footnote, after we tried these cases and got the verdict, I was able to settle 45 different uh, uh, cases. Had to go to settlement conferences with the U.S. Magistrate Judge on each one, but we broke the ice, and where the company was not willing to offer anywhere close to a split before, uh, that was different. But I can't tell you the terms of the settlement because it's confidential. That's what happens in these linear takings. They, there's no footprints. They settle and then they don't uh, have the uh, results available on public record. So here's the farm, 837 acres. Um, you can see the path of the pipeline. In that little square 
where there it says temporary workspace, uh, that's the son's home. So that's part of the case because there's two parcels. So we have a 40 acre home site with a home on it, and we have 837 acres. The pipe is going through the property, okay? Uh, 50 feet permanent, 50 feet 25 on either side, temporary. It goes through a grove of, of beautiful mature oak trees in Florida. You know, we have that Spanish moss and it's, it's gorgeous. My client paid $20,000 per acre for that land. The farmland around it, he paid about three to 5,000 acres. Those trees or the grove surround a little 20 acre pond or lake and that's where the son's home is. So the pipe goes through the grove of trees and takes out 25 mature oak trees. So now you've got this beautiful grove, but now there's a cleared area with little orange markers you know, uh, that's what the owner's left with. The pipeline goes 300 feet away from the home, the, the, his daughter's bedroom. Okay, see that jury trial coming out again. <laughs> and then it goes through the fields, not on the side of the field, okay, diagonally through. And I have a, a client that, that grows and rotates crops, watermelons, peanuts, gets watermelons for the, this portion of time. And when the pipeline comes, they don't tell you when they're going to construct. So you have no certainty. And in this case, they constructed during the watermelon season. My client has drip irrigation for watermelon. Couldn't put that in, so he planted peanuts, which are, are watered by the rain. So that's a less productive crop. So here we are. Um, you're getting a little flavor for the case. Here's the property. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It really is. That grove of trees. Is, is gorgeous. This is at, at the time of year where, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, in Florida, we're constantly green, but not all the time. This is our, this is our fall season, but we're clearing, clearing the uh, trees. That's the pond, and then the home is just in that other grove of trees right there. Here's the trees that are removed as part of the pipeline. Uh, we made every effort to try to get the company to, to not go through the, the trees. Here it is coming close to the, the beautiful little home. It's kind of a Florida cracker cabin. Uh, it's actually gorgeously redone. Here's the, the fields afterwards. Do you see a little slight discoloration in the crops? That's because when they put the pipe there, it, 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 uh, it breaks the soil characteristics. They, they take the soil out, they put the soil back. The moisture, ability to hold moisture is now different from the path of the pipe to the farming on the either side. That affects the productivity of that area. Here's the study that the pipeline company did. Now understand this is a jury trial. Their, their appraiser here was paid like $2.1 million. He comes to trial, he has 11 paired sales, just 11, okay? But he testified that of my 11, you know, where it shows, and, and he kind of did something different here, the, the, the properties that are negative actually are selling for greater. That means the impacted property with the pipe is selling for more. It's kind of an odd thing with this appraiser, but where my guy was plus, he was minus. Just a, a warning. He discounted and did not consider his superior sales. He said that the property that sold for more was better, not because of the pipe, it was just better. And then he had inferior sales, and he said, I didn't consider those either because those are inferior. That's why it's different. But I had two perfect pairs, okay? His whole opinion is based on two perfect pairs. What does an appraiser do when he uses sales? He verifies. So how many people did he talk to? Four. How long is this taking? Forever. On the word of four people that the damages are zero, that's the full weight of a $100 billion company coming to trial. And we had to go through two years on 50 cases of dog bear motions and motion practice, and their attorneys are paid by the hour. And we in Florida are paid, but we're based on a benefit, so a small case is a small case. And in 50 cases, we had mainly small cases, and we had a few big ones. Here's our evidence. This is how a paired sale should work, in my opinion. Uh, here is one part of our study. Our appraiser had 54 pairs. Some of the study, about a third of it, was this subdivision in Marion County. These are five to six acre equestrian lots. So you see the lots in red have a pipe through it, and you see the lots in yellow don't. Now here's what I couldn't believe. 
Do you know that people will buy a lot and build a house next to a pipeline? They are crazy people, okay? <laughs> but they exist. This is called evidence. <coughs> this is credible testimony because it's true. But they're crazy people. But you know what else is true about them? They're bargain hunters. <laughs> <laughs> they don't pay the same price as the folks in their subdivision that are paying, you know, and the, and the prices vary, okay? The trend is that in this subdivision, they're paying about half as much for the property on the pipe. So we are not going to the jury and saying it has no value. You know, we're not saying it's 100% loss, but we're saying there's a loss. And of course, we have in our study small properties and big properties. Okay, here's what it looks like when we get all the statistics together. All right, my time is uh, running still. But I'm pretty much out. Can I please go just a little bit? So here's the farm, larger piece. Here's the 40 acres. Uh, appraisers at eight, our appraisers at 8% damage and 45% damage based upon the evidence. Cross examine them what you want. We showed all the pictures to the jury, all the evidence to the jury. Here's what the differences were in the numbers. Pipeline companies basically offering $39,100. We don't pay you for the easement, but we see zero severance damage. The, uh, the appraiser for the owner is at 8% on the 837 acres and 45% on the 40 acres in the home, land and improvements. The client can testify, and we're on appeal on that issue as well. My client is higher than my appraiser, but he has reasons to be higher, and you can cross-examine him on it. But he's at 12%, and then my uh, other client is at 60% for his home. Here's what the jury did. Again, 8%, 12%, they came in at 9%. They did not come in at 0%. Uh, was it 45% or 60%? They said 50%. What's the difference? Either $40,000 or is it, you know, a million five? And they said a million five, which is true. Now, uh, I will have to wrap up. <laughs> so, um, here are some things. We are, uh, I did a big, long note. Know, I actually, I am not the person that was on the law review. I was kind of a moot court guy. Okay, but uh, if you practice 30 years and, and maybe uh, they name a conference after your father, you know, maybe, maybe they'll accept the submission. So I've got about 80 pages of the new journal this year. You can read all about it. And but it's out now. It's out now. It's online. And, and it's in print. I like it. <laughs> but uh, here are the, here's what we learned in the 50 cases that we did in federal courts on the Sable Trail. The, in red are the two issues on appeal. So we've got this issue about choice of law. And, and I can't give uh, Stuart a, a, a decent rebuttal, except I will say this. I, I don't think you get to the fact it, it's which constitution. Do you apply the federal constitution or the Florida constitution on, on um, the measure of compensation? And, and the first issue is what did Congress authorize Congress authorized, you may use private company, the eminent domain power, as a license under the Natural Gas Act. But the Natural Gas Act is completely silent on what measure of compensation uh, should be determined, what the rule of decision is. The pipeline company can file in state or federal court, but the federal courts, because it, it goes to the Kimball Laundry choice of law analysis, and when you have the absence of the federal government not condemning the property, where is the federal interest? It's not there. So the presumption is going to follow that great principle of federalism, that state sovereignty should apply. And where do we see state taking more uh, construct than its state property law? So that's why the court says we're going to apply state law. And Georgia Power and uh, Tennessee Gas and the other six uh, circuit decisions, they all concluded we're going to follow Kimball Laundry. We're going to do the choice of law, and we're going to make this law, private licensee without the federal interest use state law so that people have a measure of compensation. Florida has attorney's fees paid. So you can see how critical that was. But please ask yourself this. If you really want to protect landowners, and, and if it was in the Natural Gas Act that everyone got attorney's fees, everyone would get attorney's fees. Uh, it is not such a construct under our constitutional federal law that we get attorney's fees. 
Florida has it, it's part of our Constitution. But consider this, if you really want to protect landowners, give them a level playing field. Let them go to the trial. Let them, let them you know, and it's, uh, if, you, if, if you look at the Good Samaritan, the guy in the ditch, if you just, uh, if, you, if you want him to have just compensation, you can send him a get well card. But you know, if you, if you get him out of the ditch, and I'm not saying the lawyers here are the Good Samaritan, okay? <laughs> We're the innkeepers. Somebody's paying us to get somebody well. But if you don't pay for that, how are people going to stand when these private companies use eminent domain? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We've already imposed a little bit on our time, so I'm sorry we're going to have to, if you have questions for the panelists, save them for a break, save them for after the conference. Thank you so much. We're going to take a little bit of a break.